Good morning, Grace and Friends. Today's sermon, Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus, a cautionary tale. Jesus' parables provoke, challenge, and inspire. This one does all three. The rich man and Lazarus, a cautionary tale. Over history, it has changed lives and challenged nations. Let's see if we can hear it anew today. The first scene is a tableau, a set piece, two figures. The first is described in these words, there once was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day, every day, linen tablecloths, silver plate settings, fine aged wine, filet mignon with bernet sauce, a sign of asparagus, a, a stuffed potato, and Caesar salad. And for dessert, a cheesecake topped with cherries or banana foster, your choice. Just let the waiter know. It sounds like my kind of meal. He is the quintessential rich guy. His inner toddler is in full swing with the toddler's favorite words, mine, more. The Bible loves feasts. One has called it, next to Homer's Odyssey, the eatingest book in the history of the world. God loves feasts. The first three parables this summer have been about feasts, but not feasting every day and not in blind oblivion to the poor around us. Now the second figure. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table, and even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Lazarus is the only one named in all of Jesus' parables. Jesus knew his name. He wants us to know the poor by name, as essential as food. His name means, ironically, God helps. Really? But the Bible says over and over again that God comes to the aid of the poor. The man is not only poor, he's also sick, which is often the case in our nation and others. Health care is a biblical issue. He has been brought to the rich man's door, so he's also disabled. And the dog, the dog who was there probably for the same reason as the poor man, hoping for scraps from the rich man's table, he came and licked his sores. The dog may have provided more comfort to him than the rich man. I once went to Brazil to teach missionaries at their annual meeting. They took me to see the Brazilian slums or favelas. There the poor lived in cardboard and scrap huts. And around the slums were high walls with shards of glass implanted in the cement to keep the poor from climbing over the walls of the favela into the estates of their rich neighbors. I think it's biblically safe to say that God doesn't want higher walls, but longer tables. The rich man is oblivious to Lazarus's needs. As a seminary student in New York City, I would travel by train on weekends to the wealthy suburbs of Westchester County to serve Armonk Methodist Church as an assistant minister. I embarked from Grand Central Station, and as we passed through Harlem, up went the Wall Street journals and the New York Times. No one wanted to look at Lazarus. The abject poor are hard to look at. Someone has said that the bravery of a book 
is that it looks away from nothing. Jesus doesn't look away. How brave are we? The second sinner might call the great reversal. It's a little like the movie Trading Places where Eddie Murphy, the homeless man, and Dan Aykroyd, the Wall Street tycoon, trade places in life. But in this case, the scene shifts to the afterlife. They both die, both. Lazarus lived with a prospect of death every day. The rich man could have not been more surprised. But look, Lazarus is carried by the angels to heaven where he now rocks his soul in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man dies, is buried, and goes to dwell in Hades where he is in physical torment in the flames. Note, this is not a photograph of heaven or hell. <clears throat> Jesus was telling a story one somewhat like those found in other religions and in literature. It's a cautionary tale told to his first century Jewish audience. It's a little like Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. We will get to that in a minute. And a story told for us and for our nation today. The poor man is in heavenly places. The rich man is in Hades. And between them is a great chasm. Which brings us to the third scene. The rich man looks up from Hades and sees Lazarus whooping it up with Father Abraham. <clears throat> he sees, pardon me, <clears throat> he sees Lazarus and Abraham's embrace. Uh, picture a sumptuous dinner party in heaven with Lazarus reclining at table in Abraham's arms like a favored son. Now the rich man sees Lazarus. The rich man called out, Father Abraham. He still considered himself a son of Abraham, though he lived his life in opposite ways. Have mercy and send Lazarus to dip a tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am in torment in these flames. You may have heard the black spirituals setting of this scene. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool your tongue for I'm tormented in the flames. I'm tormented in the flames. I'm tormented in the flames. Black churches know who they are in the parable and they enjoy the great reversal. Abraham now speaks for the first time. My child. Abraham still regarded him a child of Abraham, even as he broke every commandment of God. Remember, he said that during your lifetime, you received the good things, the good schools, the good jobs, the good homes, the good streets, the fine food, the good health care, while Lazarus suffered evil things. But now, he's enjoying himself up here and you're in pain. It's interesting to me that Jesus considered the circumstances of Lazarus evil things. Sin Lazarus? Has a man learned anything? Still treating Lazarus as an underling? Catholic moral theology has a category that's a good description of him. It's called invincible ignorance. A noted black preacher in Harlem preaching this parable paraphrased Abraham's response to the man, listen, son, Lazarus ain't running no more errands for you. Father Abraham goes on. Besides this, a great chasm has been fixed so that none can pass from one side to the other. Here is a sober note of realism. None can pass back and forth between this world and the next, which sets up the next scene. The last scene has a surprising twist. 
we see perhaps a softening in the rich man. He asks now on behalf of his five brothers, then would you send Lazarus to warn them that they won't end up here? It's a noble request, and we might have expected a positive response from Abraham. But listen again to what Abraham said. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Now, we are the five brothers. Um, the Bible of Jesus' first hearers had three parts, three concentric circles. At the center was the Torah, the first five books of Moses. The next circle surrounding it is the prophets. And the last circle is the writings, like the Psalms. All three command our care for the poor. The most oft repeated command in the Hebrew scriptures is to care for the widows and orphans and strangers or immigrants, those most vulnerable in that society and every society. Now listen to Deuteronomy from the Torah. For the poor will never cease out of your land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother or sister to the needy and the poor in this land. Jesus once quoted the first part of this verse saying, the poor you will have with you always. And too many Christians ignoring the second part of Deuteronomy's verse have used it to sanction a, a complacency about the poor. And what about the prophets now who call us not only to care for the poor in direct acts of mercy, but also to change the laws and structures of the society that produce poverty. So uh, here the prophet Isaiah, ah, you who make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes to turn aside the needy from justice and rob the poor of my people, of their right, the poor of my people, God said. And the writings too, listen to Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. Since we live in a democracy, we should hear the verse, Give our democracy your justice, O God. It's about political policy, too. And Jesus, he does not weaken the Bible's call for mercy for the poor and for justice, though many ignore it. So Abraham says sternly to the rich man, they have the Bible and the preachers. Let them listen to them. I think we hear, we here at Grace have. If you look at the board of photos of members behind the audio desk, you will see photos of our members and then around the photos are emblems of the 20 plus organizations that we support and are personally involved in. We care for the poor and vulnerable and we work for the common good of our community. We've listened. The parable is about nations, too. It's about the wealth and income gap between the one percenters, the rich, and the rest of the nation. I could drown you in statistics, but it is the nation drowning in statistics. The top 1% owns 15 times more wealth than the bottom 50%. In the 70s, the wealthiest 1% owned about 20% of household wealth. Today, over 35%. And to cite Robert Reich, the New York Times economics writer, the rich have enough political power uh, to cut their taxes to almost nothing. President Jimmy Carter said a few years ago, we have become an oligarchy with unlimited political bribery. 
and the plight of the poorest of the poor, the Lazarus, it's gotten worse and worse. Is this not a moral issue of urgent importance? Nations die of legalized injustice. Now back to the parable. The rich man persists, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Maybe this rich man is changing. Jesus didn't say it was impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, only that it was hard. Jesus doesn't give up on any of us. Here is where Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol comes in. The ghost of Jacob Marley returns to Scrooge, and it did change him. But Abraham is dubious of such. He says, even if one should rise from the dead, they will not believe. We don't need ghosts. God doesn't send ghosts. The Bible is all we need. Jesus didn't have his resurrection in mind when he told this parable, but Luke did and we do. So even Jesus' resurrection doesn't convince everyone to listen to him. Despite the odds, however, we keep our witness going to the way of Jesus. People in history have been changed by reading this very parable, not only in lives given to the poor, but also in lives given to public service. Albert Schweitzer was changed by this parable. He was a Bach scholar, an organist, and a New Testament scholar who wrote the monumental Quest of the Historical Jesus. But this parable and the presence of the Christ arisen in our hearts, as he put it, convinced him to leave his comfortable university life in Europe and go to medical school and found a hospital in Africa. He later wrote these poignant words. I wanted to be a doctor that I might be able to work without having to talk. For years, he said, I have been giving myself out in words. Now, he said, I'm putting the religion of love into practice. I grew up playing the cello. I've always loved Bach. And I've given myself most of my life out in words. So his words and his life strike tenderly to the heart. Finally, let's go back and think about that one drop of water the rich man begged for. We can carry one drop of water to those in need every week and do. Who has helped at ICM? or serve meals at Fifth Street, or helped with Meals on Wheels, or worked with children with learning disabilities, or supported the youth of our community in PFLAG, helped with Speak Life and Live, taught children anywhere. Your one drop of water matters. Blessed are you, Jesus said who carry a cup of water to the world. Sue, Sue told me about going to the Vanilla Bean coffee shop uh, to meet with Linda Marshall. Um, an older homeless man was sitting outside on one of the tables drinking his cup of coffee. You may have seen him. Um, the people at Vanilla Bean give him a free cup of coffee every morning as they open and don't shoo him away from the table at the front door. A drop of water. Sue said that uh, when they passed, Linda greeted him cheerfully, good morning, and then said, well, what do you think about the weather? One drop of water. This parable of Jesus can sneak up on us, come in the side door, do its holy work in us, 
even us here in church again, who know all about Moses and the prophets and Jesus. Amen.